the 9 o'clock service read my sermon title and asked me to sing some of them there. But I really like the old come back next week. So I will spare you my rendition of Mamma Mia. I chose the title because of how expressive the phrase Mamma Mia can be. So as a parent, you have been proactive, and you've taken the list that was provided to you before the first day of school, that list of supplies, and you've bought the six tubs of wipes and the six boxes of Kleenex, and you've packed them into this brand new backpack and strapped them on your kid's back looking like a pack mule on his way to school. You got the brand new clothes on him all ready to go, and they come back that night after their first day with the second list that their teacher provides. Mamma mia! <laughs> or you study all night, right, with your child for that test they have the next day, and you yourself are not quite convinced at breakfast the next morning that they're going to pass the test because you yourself are not convinced that you would pass the test. <laughs> And they come home from that school day with an A. Mama mia! It's awesome! <laughs> Parenting is full of questions. Motherhood, those have been mothers to it. So full of questions. And so many times that question is do I have enough? Do I have enough money? Do I have enough time? Do I have enough love? Do I have enough of the right answers? Do I have enough strength? So much of asking, do I have enough? In this text, Jesus, I believe, is dealing with that question. Leading up to this story, Jesus has been rejected by his hometown. Not the most affirming experience if you're starting a ministry. His mentor, John the Baptist, has been executed. Not the most affirming experience of those starting a ministry. So he's gotten into a boat and gone off by himself. And he climbs out of the boat to be confronted by this large crowd. 5,000 men plus women and children, so maybe 10, 15,000. A city, right? A small town has shown up at the shore. Jesus is disheartened by his experience of ministry so far. He gets in the boat, gets out of the boat, and is confronted by this city. I would be asking, do I have enough? And Jesus' response is, we are blessed, right? We are blessed to follow Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ's response was to have compassion and to heal them. I can't fathom what that was like. Certainly they weren't all sick, but to climb out of the boat and instantly be confronted by a town of people and you're walking around and you're with them and you're present, we are blessed. The story gives us several perspectives, right? We also have the perspective of the crowd. They themselves took a risk to be out there. Something about Jesus was so inspiring that they took the risk to leave their home, go out into the wilderness, and take people with them into the wilderness to find hope. But the perspective I think the story wants us to look through is that of the disciples. All four Gospels remember the story for us, and that's kind of rare. Each of the Gospel writers had their own memory of Jesus' life. They give us their own perspective of what Jesus was doing. But this is the one miracle story that all four Gospels remember for us. And when Matthew remembers it, the activity of the disciples is more prominent than the others. The disciples, I can fully understand where they're coming from. Pragmatic folks, they look out at this town full of people, we're in the wilderness, they know what happens. You get hungry. There is no food. So the logical answer is, send the people to where there is food so they can eat. But Jesus gives them the illogical call upon their lives. It's a call that if you engage your faith well, you will have this call in your life. You will be blessed to have this kind of thing <coughs> to you where you are asked to risk and give what you have, even when you think what you have may not be enough. I saw a comic uh, preparing for the sermon on the resources. There was this comic. One of the disciples is at a vendor's booth and it says, it's got fish. It says, buy two, get 5,000. <laughs> that is where I would have gone shopping for this event. But Jesus says, bring me your five loaves and your two fish. Give me what you have. And it will be enough. The disciples are invited to participate in what's happening. 
It's easy to get distracted by the miracle side, Jesus actually doing the miracle, because that is utterly amazing. But the way Matthew remembers the story is to invite you and I to be one of the disciples and participate in that moment because that's how God invites us to live our faith. Not as passive people waiting for God to come in and fix something as much as those who are risk takers willing to give what we have and let God use that to make the miracle. Will Rogers says, go ahead and climb out on the limb. That's where the fruit is. How many of our relationships would benefit from that kind of engagement? If we just let a relationship go on its own, they usually stay kind of shallow, right? There's nothing that pushes the relationship to grow and to develop. But when we risk, when we take the risk to be vulnerable to the other person, to give them our love, to give them the things that we have, even if they don't deserve it or they haven't earned it, to give them ourselves, then the relationship begins to grow, begins to develop. If you've been in one of those relationships, you know how that works. And sometimes it's painful. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, whichever one you're reading, we see Jesus making the same choice and getting consequences that Jesus claimed are worthwhile. Sometimes those consequences that Jesus chose are amazing, like this story. A whole town full of people fed. Jesus made the choice to climb out of the boat, have compassion on them. He called his disciples to participate. And so amazing that four gospel writers, they all wanted us to remember the story. Sometimes it's not amazing. Sometimes it's very painful. Sometimes Jesus makes the choice to risk his life, to risk what he has and give it to us. And we are laying down palm branches in front of him and singing those hymns. And then sometimes we're not so nice. And we hurt Jesus. And Jesus is open. I think Jesus does this, not because Jesus had these two disheartening experiences and then climbing a boat, had a little R&R &R with a fishing pole. I don't think it was just Jesus going out and recharging his batteries with a little quiet time on his own, and then he came back and thought, oh, I'm all refreshed and ready to go. It was a great nap. I think Jesus climbs in that boat and has a conversation with God. And when Jesus climbs out of that boat, he's responding to that conversation. To his prayer time with God. He was obedient to God. He was following God's call upon his life to risk, to give, and trust that what he gave was enough. And it was. The other thing that comes out of the story, Jesus is pushing the disciples not just to give as a risk and trust that it will be enough, but to give without asking whether or not the recipient is good enough. Because when Jesus does that, Jesus always has the same answer. You are good enough. Jesus was there in the moment of creation. God said, it is good. Jesus, when he sees people that are cast out, pulls them back into community because in Jesus' eyes, they are good. All of us, all of you, children of God, are good. Loved by God. So our response, our thankful response to God already claiming that in our life is to treat others the same way. I get to pray for us today.